Good morning. Welcome to Colonial Church this morning. My name is Aaron Roberts, and I'm really glad you're here, th here this morning. Um, as we begin our time together, in each one of our pews, we have a pew pad. So take that out, place your name in that, pass that down to whoever may be next to you. And if you see somebody you don't know this morning, be sure to introduce yourself and get to, get to know them as well. Um, also, if there's a prayer that you have that you want to share with our entire church community, please take one of the prayer cards in the pew, fill that out, and then place that in the offering plate later in the service. Um, as we come into the time of worship, I've just got a couple announcements for today. You can read all the rest of them in the Sunday crier that's in the bulletin. But um, one thing is, is that our gathering Sunday, our, um, Sunday celebration is not going to be at the park this year. We're, we're going to bring it back here to Colonial, and we're going to have it in the social hall downstairs with games and a potluck. The details are all in the, in the crier, um, but it's going to be on September 8th. So on September 8th, don't go to the park. Stay here. Uh, then this Tuesday at 6 p.m., we're having our Colonial Pub Night at 6 p.m. over at the, at the Kansas City uh, Beer Company, which is just over in Waldo. The information, and if you're interested in coming, you can just, uh, it's, all the information's out on Facebook, or I believe it's in our Sunday Crier as well today. So the question today is, what does it take for a person to jeopardize their own sense of well-being, even to risk their safety out of love for a neighbor. Throughout history, there have been these people who have taken those kind of risks. And we as church, we keep their memory alive in our worship, knowing that God inspires people beyond their fear to act in the name of compassion. And ultimately, it comes down to this question. What does it take for you, for me, to jeopardize my own safety, my own sense of well-being in service to my neighbor? Because the answer to that question, it's deeply personal. And it is a matter of faith. Now, we come into this time, uh, this holy time, in spirit and in truth, because God's spirit is alive and speaking. And so let's listen. Let's worship. Now, sometimes to hear God's Spirit, you have to slow down. You've got to be at peace. You've got to take the time to listen to your conscience, that voice that speaks to your soul. Now is the time to set aside all the business stuff, all the stuff that's been rattling around in your head, to set that aside for a while and to just breathe and be open to God. So I invite you now, if you want to close your eyes for a second, and just to close your eyes and take a moment to just take a deep breath. Try to feel, try to experience God's presence in your body in these few sacred moments. Spirit of the living God, speak. We are listening. Amen. God's Spirit calls on each of us in different ways to be moved to be act in the name of compassion. Jesus once called his disciples to come to work from a lake shore, and his Spirit continues to call to us to follow. So let's rise now and sing, Tu has viendo a la orilla. I'm learning how to pronounce Spanish. You have come down to the lake shore, which is number 173 in our hymnal, or it'll be on screen. Please rise.
be seated. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from the love of God and neighbor. So will you pray with me? We let our, our system, system of love, love us take advantage of the immigrants, using their labor, labor for our benefit, or not only including them in our community and society. We have betrayed our neighbor by worshiping human laws over the commandments of God. Help us to repent and in works of love and welcoming the stranger, help us to return to that love of God. We confess we have not loved you for all our heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. I invite you now, in a moment of silence, to recommit yourself to love of God and neighbor, and to be part of fixing a system that has brought pain and separation for thousands of families. God, accept our repentance today for the way we have allowed neglect of your highest law of compassion. Let our indifference to injustice end here and now, as the struggle for the dignity and care of our immigrant brothers, sisters, mothers, and fathers continues today. Please rise. kind of are here pretty often. Do you know this? We seek to worship God in spirit and in truth and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love of neighbor, near and far, is a core, a core commitment of this church community. So in the spirit of love, let's greet all of our neighbors in the hope of friendship and peace.
When you are feeling safe and secure in your own life, if you're in a place in your life where you're not worrying about where your next meal is going to come from, or if you're going to be able to stay in your house, all those kind of basic concerns, it is really easy to avoid doing something, avoid doing anything that might jeopardize your sense of well-being. You see injustice and cruelty in the empire, but there is nothing you can do about it, or so you tell yourself. So a couple of weeks ago, we heard about, we heard the story of Haman's plan to annihilate all the Jews in the Persian Empire. After feeling slighted that Queen Esther's cousin Mordecai didn't bow down to him. Uh, so Haman convinced the king to give him the authority to give, take control of the Jewish invasion. So Mordecai contacts Esther. Mordecai told her everything that had, that had happened to him including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave her a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa. And he told her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Esther responded to her cousin Mordecai, all the king's officials and all the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. He replied, do, you, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will, be, will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. <clears throat> and who knows but that, you would, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So what does it take to move a person to do something, do anything, that might jeopardize their own sense of well-being or even of safety. Now for me, I have come to find out that it's kids. At the core of my being, I am a father. The loving protection of children is tied to my soul. And I remember it was a few years back, and I remember because I was crashed out on my couch watching television one evening, when I got a call from Damon Daniels, and Damon is, he's a local community organizer that I'd gotten to know through our church's invol in involvement with community organizing through Justice and Witness, and he was calling because he was in tears because he had just, well, he was healing, he had just gotten released from the hospital. What had happened was he had gone out to Ferguson after Michael Brown's shooting, and he had organized a group of kids to do something positive to do a voter registration booth. And those kids had been out just registering people to, to vote. And there had been a movement through. They didn't think that they had to run because they weren't doing anything wrong. And these teenagers were shot with rubber bullets. And they had these huge, huge um, bruises on their sides, as did he. And for me, that is what got me off the couch. I decided I needed to go to Ferguson to do what I could do to nonviolently protect kids. For me, it's about kids. I know that that's the thing that will get me off the couch to even to jeopardize my own sense of well-being and safety. And the story about Esther doesn't say exactly what was inside of her that was her thing, her internal motivation. But she had her thing because she acted. Do you know what yours is? Do you know what that thing inside of you is that would move you from, being, from going away from your sense of safety or well-being for the sake of a neighbor who you might never know? Back in 1944, during the Second World War, the Nazis were getting desperate. On the West, the... Allies had landed at Normandy, and on the east, the, uh, the Red Army was starting to move in, in like this. And 
a Spanish diplomat had been assigned to Budapest. And in Budapest at this particular time, there were 80,000 Jews remaining. These were the only Jews that had not been yet sent off to the death camps. And this man, his name was Angel Sanbriz. He had diplomatic immunity. And so as long as he didn't do anything crazy, he was relatively safe. He wasn't in Germany. He was outside of that. So he was relatively safe if he just kept his head down. He had a wife and he had five kids. He had a lot to lose. But what happened, and this didn't make any sense, but of course things don't need to make sense. It didn't make sense for them, for Haman, to want to kill every single Jew in the Persian Empire just because he got slighted. His little ego got damaged by one person. It didn't make sense that the Germans would use valuable resources to round up 80,000 Jews to, to exterminate them when they could have used those resources in other ways to keep the war effort alive even. But yet, that's what happened. Even in our present day fears, we are a long way from that kind of horror. Thank God. May we never see a time such as that. May we never allow anything like that to ever get close. Now back in her day, Queen Esther didn't really have any real power in the empire. Not really. She barely even saw the king. And if she tries to approach him without being summoned, if she gets a little uppity like Vashti got, she could be executed. Her cousin Haman reminds her that she too is a Jew. And if she stays silent, she could well be executed along with all the other Jews anyway. And who knows? Maybe God put you into a place that you are for just such a time as this. Maybe God has put you into the place that you are for just a time such as this. And so Esther came up with a plan to charm the king with a couple of banquets in his honor that she was going to throw for him. And we heard about the king a little bit these last couple of weeks. He has a real need to be admired. And so he was all in on the banquets to celebrate him. Some of the, and this is what Camille was talking about, some of the best resistance movements in history are actually kind of corny. They aren't loud. Resistance by dinner party. Resistance by bureaucracy. You use what you got. So Angel Sanbreeze, he made a decision. He was moved to resist the Nazis' final solution and save as many Jews as he could. And so he, like everybody else in Budapest in those years, knew what was about to happen. They saw what was happening. Tens of thousands of Jews had already been killed. So Angel he found an obscure law. And it was in a law, an obscure law that granted Spanish citizenship to Sephardic Jews who were exiled back in the 15th century. Because everybody knows about that law. And these are in the days before the internet. And so there was no easy way for the Germans to verify this law or not. So the Nazis agreed to allow him to grant Spanish citizenship to 200 Jews. Unfortunately, the ink smudged something, I don't know, something, something smudged in the, on the letter, and Angel accidentally thought the letter said 200 families. So he granted Spanish citizenship to 200 families. Nice, nice. And he personally paid for all 200 households to be moved out of the ghetto into apartments because he figured that eventually the Allies would get there. Now, the Red Cross kind of got wind of what he was doing. 
And some of the local churches got wind of what he was doing too. And these citizenship papers, this uh, rampant bureaucracy, blew up, blew up and, got, and those papers found their way into the hands of 5,000 Jews. Now, after a few months, the Nazis, so they started figuring out what was going on. But the Red Army was pretty close. And San Breeze and his family had escaped into Switzerland. When the, when, the queen and, when the king and Harman came in for the banquet with Queen Esther, the king said to her, This is the second day we've met for wine. What is your wish, Queen Esther? I'll give it to you. What do you want? I'll give you anything. I'll do anything, even give you half, your, half the kingdom. Queen Esther said, If I please the king, and if the king wishes, give me my wife. That's my wish. And the wives of my people, too. That's my desire. We have been sold, I and my people, to be wiped out, killed, and destroyed. If we simply had been sold as male and female slaves, I would have said nothing. But no enemy can compensate the king for this kind of damage. King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, said to Queen Esther, who is this person and where is he? Who would dare do such a thing? Esther replied, a man, who, a, a man who hates an enemy, this wicked Haman. Haman was overcome with terror in the presence of the king and queen. Furious, the king got up and left the banquet for the palace garden. But Haman stood up to beg Queen, El queen Esther for his life. He saw clearly that the king's mood meant, meant a bad end for him. The king returned with, from the palace garden to the banquet room just as Haman was kneeling on the couch where Esther was reclining. Will you even molest the queen while I am in the house? The king said. The words had barely left the king's mouth before Haman's face was covered with dread. Habana, one of the, one of the eunuchs ser serving the king said, so look, there was the stake that Haman made for Mordecai, the man who, st who spoke up and did something good for the king, standing at Haman's house, 75 feet high. Impale him on it, the king ordered. So they impaled Haman on the, very, on the very pole that he had set up for Mordecai. Even after Angel San Breeze and his family had arrived in Switzerland and into safety, there was a guy named Giorgio Perlasca who continued this whole bureaucratic ruse of handing out Spanish citizenship papers. And he was hoping that with everything going on with the war, the Nazis might not realize that he was actually the replacement Spanish, he was not the Spanish replacement diplomat. In fact, he wasn't Spanish at all, he was Italian. And more than that, he wasn't a diplomat. He was just some guy who, inspired by what he saw Angel San Breeze doing, decided to risk his own life to step up and to create this paperwork to save Jews, to save lives. The truth is that Esther and Angel San Breeze, they broke the law. They broke an unjust law because there are times where justice, injustice must be resisted. Compassion is God's highest law. And each of us, every one of us, has to know when the Spirit is moving inside of you, to know when God is calling on you to perhaps jeopardize your own sense of well-being, of safety, in the name Off of compassion for agents neighbor. in Tennessee, neighbors and activists forming a human chain to stop ICE officials from taking a man into custody. Steve Osinsami has more. Good morning, Steve. Good morning to you, Robin. These federal agents are, of course, doing their jobs and enforcing the law, but the following is also true. These neighbors are listening to their conscience. This is the scene playing out in cities across the country, neighbors taking on ICE agents. In Nashville, they formed this human chain, successfully blocking two immigration agents from taking away a father who's lived here for the last 14 years. He was inside the white van with his son. All of us just came together and we did the right thing. 
when it did it for a million other families. We'll do it today, we'll do it tomorrow. This is what America is all about. Even the sheriff refused a call to the scene, saying in a statement this morning that his office does not in any way participate in ICE raids. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, you've moved people in every time. And in a time such as this, you call once again to open our eyes and respond in the name of compassion, your highest law. So in your holy presence, may each of us ask, what does it take to move me in the name of compassion to jeopardize my own sense of well-being? And then give me the courage to respond with you as my guardian and guide. Amen. We please rise to pray in song, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness, which is number 286 in the hymnal or on screen.
Please be seated. A couple of years ago, there was a church family in our, in our church community here who had me over to their house because they were offering to be uh, a harbor, a sanctuary in their house in case families in our wider community, community began to be rounded up for internment. And one of the children in the family showed me down to their basement where they have kind of a, a false wall. And she pointed and she said, well, we could hide people in here. And it broke my heart to think that ever the day would come where we would have need once again for an underground railroad. But I know this. God will continue to speak and to inspire people to take risks in the name of love. As our offering is being received this morning, I invite you to hear the words of sweet honey and the rock speak to your soul. Will the ushers please receive our offering? Please rise.
join me as we pray a blessing for this offering. As we, we offer, offer our gifts to you, O Lord God, God. may we remember those who are forgotten by us too many, many times. times. The hungry, the lonely, the homeless, the vulnerable, yet are our important citizens in your kingdom of grace, justice, and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I've had moments this last week where I just, there's so much going on. I was, Sharon and Jan and I were talking, so many crises just in people's lives, so much hurt and so much pain, and sometimes it feels like things are spinning and spiraling. It is the power of prayer that reminds us that we are not alone on this journey. It is God's holy presence that works in us and it works with us to be love in this world. And I've needed prayer this week. And now we come into a time where we share the prayers of the people in this church community, the things that you have offered. And after each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy. And can we pray together saying, hear our prayer. Bob Laveau has cancerous tum tumors in his neck. He had those removed this last week. And um, they, that was done very successfully. And they're going to continue to treat him in the coming week and map that out. But in all of this, Bob asks that we pray for a sense of peace and calm to be with him as he goes through the storm. Lord, in your mercy. And Frank, you're here this morning. Frank had a little run to the emergency room and was in a scare this week. And I am so relieved. He texted me yesterday and I said, I'm going home and I'll be in church tomorrow. And I just want to tell you how happy I am about that. So, Lord, in your mercy. Lucille Jewett's body is dying. She's over at Adventist Health right now, and she's receiving hospice care. And I, many of you may not know Lucille, but I want to tell you a little bit about her. She was part of this church's care ministry before there was an official care ministry in this congregation. She helped that get going. She has prayed for everyone at time to time. You may have received a card at some point from her. Her life has stood for compassion and love. And so on this morning, as she is getting ready to make that transition to be with the Lord, we surround her with prayers and love. Lord, in your mercy. So we are in the process of looking for a new person to work down in our nursery. And last Sunday, we interviewed somebody, and she was great. And she had a real kind of adventure this week, and so we want to pray for her. So we offered her the job, and things were looking good. She was going to be here this Sunday. Well, she went to the hospital this week with a really unexplained pain. Well, within a few hours, she delivered a full-term ba baby. That was a surprise. And so we actually are going to get to welcome two new people, Kirsten, who's going to be working in our church nursery, and Haley. And so um, for her and for, and for the surprises that life brings us, we thank God. Lord, in your mercy. God inspires people to sometimes take risks in faith. And that, making that choice that is a deeply personal and can be incredibly powerful. It is an act of faith. So let's take for a moment now for us in faith to commune with God's Spirit as we pray silently together. In our community's continuing prayers, we keep all people who are both living and serving in the middle of war in prayer. And we ask for God's Holy Spirit to keep people safe and to help us all find a path to peace. And for those caregivers and for those who are living with dementia, may they receive the respect and the love that they deserve. And we pray for God's guidance for this nation's ideals of freedom and justice for all people in these turbulent times. And we pray for anyone who is living in the shadow of depression or mental illness, and we ask for God's light of hope to shine. And for those immigrants and refugees who are far from the land they knew, we ask for safety and compassion to come from Christ Church. And for those loved ones in our lives who are with cancer, and other ongoing life-threatening conditions, we pray. 
for Bob Laveau, Ross Yon, Bob Kimbrough, Sean Bolter, Karen Fogelsong, Kathy Hellwedge, Logan Lowry, Andrew Wood, Nathan Green, Clive Griffiths, Cindy Russell, William Scar, and Lee Framont. May God's strength flow from our prayers to them. God, inspire your servants to resist oppression and help, us del and help deliver us from evil. Let's pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I just received a text just as I was up here that kind of show up on the screen. Lucille Jewett just took her last breath. Let's take a moment of silence. Hold our sister. Amen. There are people who stand up and live lives of conscience. Shirley Helena Murray was the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in New Zealand back in the 1980s. And her work as the moderator of those church communities led her to, to be a strong voice for justice. And she began to write hymns in support of human rights, women's concerns, justice, peace, and the integrity of creation, and for the unity of church. Let's rise now and sing her hymn, Great God of Earth and Heaven, which is number 579 in the hymnal, we're on screen. Please rise. What does it take for a person to jeopardize their own sense of well-being and even to risk their safety out of love for a neighbor? 
Today we celebrate the story of two and maybe even three people who faithfully acted beyond their fear in the name of compassion. Each of us may be called on at some point to ask that question, what does it mean for me to jeopardize my own sense of well-being, my own safety out of love for my neighbor? And the answer to that is deeply personal. And it is a matter of faith. And I hope that you have felt moved by God this morning to help answer that question for you. Because this is a vital part of our community's journey to walk together in Christian love. So I invite you now to turn toward the center aisle as we make a covenant to continue that journey together. And even if you're at a point in your life where you don't feel like you can make this covenant, that is perfectly fine. Please receive these words then as a blessing and a prayer that someday you will. We covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in Christian love. We seek to worship God in spirit and in truth and to love our neighbor as ourselves. With God's help, we will honor Colonial Church in our conduct, support its program, and extend the influence of Christ throughout the world. I went over shortly before becoming here knowing that Lucille was dying. And these are some of her last words. She said, the people of Colonial Church, there was something special about that church. I've been there, part of that community for a lot of years. She said, there is something special about the love that comes from the people there. And then her great-grandchildren came over and we put our hands on hers and she bowed her head and we blessed her for the road ahead. We all have a road ahead of us. All of us go out into this world because our worship may be over now, but our service, our continuation to be good news, to be light, it continues now. So go in peace and live your life passionately, compassionately, and love faithfully, and celebrate every moment of life that you've got from now until your life's finale. Because our God of resurrecting grace goes with you and in you always. Amen.